I am very sorry that I couldn't be here with you today uh, in Singapore. I was looking forward to it very much. But since I'm addressing a room full of journalists, I'm probably sure you're aware of what is happening in Washington, D.C. with the federal budget, uh, which would prevented me from being able to attend. However, the conference organizers graciously allowed me to be able to come and speak to you this way. And uh, so I think someone said, the show must go on, so let's get on with the show. The core of my talk is really about the question, are we in a golden age of journalism? I believe we are. Um, there's been an explosion of creativity across journalism uh, that gets me very excited. Data visualization, open news hacking, social curation, user-generated content. It's a fantastic time to be a part of journalism. But before we go too far in our idealism, we need to balance the potential of the digital age with uh, the critical values that distinguish journalism from public relations. Borrowing a phrase from David Enser, director of Voice of America, where I'm recording this video, uh, he said, we aggressively need as reporters to utilize new tools, but stick close, keep close to the old journalistic values. Uh, new tools, old values, and I heartily agree with them. For the old values of journalism are the best guides on how to apply the technological advantages we have today. A subtext of this talk is that digital tools can build and help you access new markets, but it's going to be high quality content and the journalistic values embedded in that content that will build you audiences and in the long term, uh, sustainability, relevance, and viability. So technology helps you access markets, but it's journalist journalistic values and content that build the audiences. So I want to cover some of the profound changes that technology has wrought on how we gather and publish the news. And specifically, I want to talk briefly about sources, speed, and accuracy. And then I'm going to go on uh, to discuss the implications of these tools in digital tools and speed, sources, and accuracy on the newsroom of the future. So speed. On May 1st, 2011, a simple tweet from a man in Pakistan woken by helicopters illustrated the potential of the internet to become a viable journalistic source. Despite highly compartmentalized knowledge, nape of the earth flying with radar absorbing helicopters, uh, one of the most important military operations of the US war against terror was revealed by a guy who couldn't sleep. The Osama raid tweet was a stark display that with the right tools and knowledge, social platforms could be a powerful source of sources for news organizations. In the digital age, you have the potential as a journalist to leverage every cell phone, every camera uh, in a cell phone, every tweet, every Facebook post as a source. Now, while the Osama raid tweet was found by reporters through, more through luck than anything, there is a growing usage of social media forensics in journalism. Social mining tools like Mass Relevance, Radiant 6, uh, social flow, as well as some of the more uh, academic tools, allow journalists to quickly, through so, uh, quickly sort through social content, the millions, billions of tweets and, and Facebook posts and other social media to find the nuggets of journalistic information. Now, used as a blunt object, newsrooms are using social data uh, analysis to try to identify trends early. In this mode, newsrooms are not always applying their core journalistic values of sourcing and context, but just thinking about being the first to report on a news event. More sophisticated users uh, use social data analysis to ask more interesting questions. Well, why did this event occur? Who is associated with it? How is the public influenced by it? Who is reliable and authoritative source on what is happening? How information moves between people and across networks uh, are essential elements of understanding the news today. For example, in the recent attack at the Westgate Mall in Kenya, there was a running PR battle between Al-Shabaab and the Kenyan government uh, as a real battle was actually taking place, which I think is probably stunning in itself. For a journalist, that back, on, back and forth on Twitter was newsworthy. But using social forensics, reporters have a better opportunity to broaden the story. 
uh, to understand the context of the, uh, the attack with all of its religious, ethnic, and political implications. For instance, how does the Arabic population of Mombasa in Kenya view al-Shabaab, a Somali-based terror organization? What are the various reactions by the people of Kenya on the attack? And how do these reactions align with tree, key tribal and political organizations? And finally, uh, which I think is probably one of the more interesting ones, is what is the discussion and thoughts of the Somalia diaspora in places like the U.S., Canada, uh, and England with the Somali population? So while this information is not a traditional source, it is the distillation of comments, feelings, and engagement of millions of sources. Social media data, in the essence, is a meta source, a source of sources that can truly help inform a story. There is an immensely important role for journalistic values, however, in understanding and using social data. It can be a dangerous proposition to not to apply basic journalism skepticism. A great quote from Jennifer Carnegie, di director of communications at the New York ACLU, said, when everyone has a video camera with them at all times, the potential is limitless. But there is clearly a downside to that because when everybody is submitting stuff, it's hard to know in real time what is valid. There is the potential for mistruths to be out there. And I heartily agree. Now, in terms of sources, there is a second powerful new source, and perhaps one that's still in its infancy that we need to take uh, advantage of, and that is data and data itself. Journalism is rooted in storytelling, and the tradition of is a reporter going out and talking to as many people as possible to be able to shape a story and understand it. And it almost goes without saying that when I say sources, 99% of you in the audience think people. However, we have to start broadening our minds. Computer-aided reporting and journalism and data visualizations by people like uh, organizations like NPR, uh, Ushahidi, Info Amazonia, New York Times, and infographics like Visualizing Palestine are beautiful examples of how data is not only enhances storytelling but is the story. Data is a valley, valued and valid, highly relevant journalism source because powerful data analysis tools now have become accessible and affordable for non-technical users. For as a journalist, you don't need a PhD in statistics or have the title of a data scientist to be able to mine journalistic insights from data sets. This is information that was not possible to glean from any one person or even groups of people in the past. And data journalism and data sets as a source uh, is a new way to try to understand, again, the big picture and understand the context of what is happening inside that big picture. So if your future newsroom is going to start recruiting data sources, um, a good place to start to understand this is the Data Journalism Handbook and getting your reporters to understand the basics of things like uh, Google Fusion Tables and Tableau. So the second, the second uh, uh, key issue that's been affected by digital media is speed. The increased speed in which news organizations gather and publish content is one of the most notable change, challenges uh, uh, for digital organizations today. An over-focus on speed without a respect for accuracy leads to problems, often quite public problems, for careless news organizations. Our ability to identify information and publish it quickly has sometimes outstripped our collective journalism judgment. My analogy is that we just gave my seven-year-old the keys to a Ferrari. However, there is a reason that speed to publish is a part of journalism. This speed is because of an abundance of riches. The sheer amount of observers with social media accounts, cameras, and audio devices pointed at every news event happening in the world gives reporters and editors an ability to access and then rocket content around the world. And this 24-7 unblinking eye has brought us the iconic real-time images of news events that we would never have seen before. So sometimes speed is the point. You know, I have sat transfixed in front of my computer watching the Tahrir Square protests as they unfolded in real time in front of me, and I was on the square. 
Um, we saw Nada Agan Solta die before our eyes uh, during the 2009 protests. And we watched as people were plucked out of the frozen uh, Hudson River from U.S. Airways Flight 1549 that was crashed. And we were seeing these things as it was happening, uh, as it was recorded on cell phones and posted onto the Internet. So speed in which journalists and audience and the audience itself facilitated raw content was, has been a powerful witness to important events, events that only a few years before would have been hidden uh, from us. In this case, immediacy and realism, the being there, was the point, uh, was true journalism, and that editor, the editorial judgment was to point the camera and not interpret the events at the time. But there are downsides to speed uh, without journalistic and editorial judgment. In the, US, uh, in the U.S., the Boston bombing, it was Pete Williams of NBC News who brought a strong journalistic perspective to rapidly evolving events. And for the Arab Spring, for Twitter audiences at least, it was my friend Andy Carvin of NPR. Um, both of these journalists, whether doing original reporting or curating original sources or exclusive information, stopped to ask the all-important question, do we have another source? Um, can we corroborate that? As Pete Williams described uh, his approach to reporting, the essence of journalism is the process of selection. Today, speed to market is an important to the credibility of newsrooms, but also to the financial bottom line as speed brings eyeballs. But our future newsroom has to balance speed with my next topic, and that is accuracy. So accuracy is not antithetical to speed. Editorial judgment connected to digital workflows can work efficiently to produce sensical and accurate content in near real time. Like sources and speed, accuracy can be aided by technology. But today, we have to reassess our understanding of accuracy in a digital world. At the core of accuracy is context. What is reliable? What is verifiable? What's in the public interest? And which public? Uh, what is the proportionality of one story to another? So when we think about accuracy in journalism today, one of the things we have to think about is uh, the public is no longer a passive or remote receiver of the news. They are a participant. And the best organizations not only understand that, they enroll the public in working with them to make reporting possible that was, uh, that was not possible before. Crowdsourcing. Um, uh, is a new way in which we can reach out to the public directly to aid reporters and they pursue stories. And this is exemplified, in my opinion, by the work of The Guardian in the UK as they produced incredibly detailed, insightful, and frankly just interesting information about the British MP expense scandal in 2009. So faced with mountains and mountains, I mean literally thousands of pages of MP uh, expense reports, they turn to the audience to help them process these uh, pages into data, which then could be utilized in reporting. But beyond that, they trusted their audience to actually participate in a deeper way. And in fact, asked their audience to point out uh, interesting things that they found when they were reading these reports and putting them into data. Basically, tapping the audience on the shoulder and saying, hey, would you please tell us about the juicy bits? And the success of working with the audience has led to Guardian Witness, a new crowdsource platform for their journalism. On this platform, Guardian reporters can go to the public and ask them for all range all matters of help. They could uh, upload a picture, uh, make a comment, take a survey, uh, give their opinion, uh, get a piece of video. And so the role of crowdsourcing in improving the accuracy is starting to grow. In the U.S., ProPublica's Free the Files project around asking the U.S. Uh, citizenry to help transcribe U.S. political spending, again, from thousands of pages of paper reports uh, and, and online content, uh, uh, in turn allowed ProPublica to release a new tool that we should all take a look at, which is called Transcrib Transcribable. Uh, an open source project that allows journalists to build crowdsourcing projects. There's another uh, tool or a new company actually out there called OpenWatch, uh, where news organizations can task uh, or find uh, already uploaded content of citizen a network of citizen journalists around the world. 
it was used to great effect in both in Egypt and in the Turkish Istanbul uh, protests. There are other services like Storiful, which you, uh, you ascribe to, and you can get information that is crowdsourced and verified by Storiful, and that really extends the editorial process in the newsroom. So there is another technology, and this is more of an emergent technology that I think that we need to think about in accuracy, and that is algorithms. Uh, yes, a very geeky topic. So um, there are a number of people out there thinking about how algorithms and computer agents can help us more quickly determine the accuracy of information. One thing I'll point to is the Washington Post's recently launched Truth Teller uh, project, an algorithm-based project that um, compares transcripts of video and audio with a database of facts to see if politicians or other people are telling the truth. So speed, sources, accuracy are truly transformed in the way that uh, digital media has brought to journalism. It really changed the newsroom. And so what does that future newsroom look like? Um, what does that newsroom uh, look like? Who's in it? What are the necessary skills? And how is it to be managed? Well, one place to start is with Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, and the recent owner, purchaser of the Washington Post. On his first visit to the Washington Post newsroom, he reportedly told the assembled staff, put readers, not advertisers, first. Don't write to impress each other. And above all, don't be boring. If I was designing my dream newsroom today and I did not want to be boring, here is who I would have in it. So the first are reporters who can code and shoot. Reporters need to understand both how to tell the story, but they also need to understand the basics of technology and digital media. They need to understand HTML, uh, JavaScript, uh, basics of digital visualization, data visualization, social media platforms, uh, advanced customer management, uh, sorry, advanced uh, content management uh, systems. The goal is to have a journalist who can write and record, but also understand what tool or platform is the most effective at the moment to tell that story. In addition to just reporters who can code and shoot, I would ask newsrooms to have a computer-assisted data reporter. Every newsroom needs to have staff who can more deeply understand and focus on how data is a source and a storytelling, uh, storytelling format in itself. Now, my next uh, key player in the newsroom of the future are social media editors. But rather than just repost news on Facebook, the social media editor understands how news content can be gleaned from and enhanced by the audience. They have the skills to quickly find valuable information, uh, the ability to understand what is a new source from social media content or a surprising insight. Then they have the all-important job of turning that insight into great news content. A social media editor is not a service to a newsroom. They are a fully-fledged reporter and a key component of any newsroom team. My next role is a front-end news application designer developer. Uh, the future-leaning newsroom has to be able to move quickly to deploy and customize a variety of storytelling and data visualization applications to help improve the news. Uh, the geeks and coders, which I am happily one of, can't sit in the basement any longer, and that's where generally we are pe being put. Um, uh, we need to sit beside the reporters. From NPR's lost and found photo story to the New York Times snowfall to La Tassera's, uh remembrance of Chile's coup application, uh, coup, I'm sorry, application designers are working in newsrooms, uh, sitting alongside reporters to tell interactive and immersive stories to draw readers in, build unique storytelling formats, and create new experiences unlike any other in traditional means. So my last key player is the digital media analyst. Data-driven insights into the audience and how they consume and react to, use, and even share content can help editors and reporters shape when and where and how they present content. Data-driven insights into audience can also help editors understand where they're not being successful. Uh, news organizations are making a big mistake if all they see in analytics is, hey, we're up, we're down this week. So today I've discussed how new digital tools of journalism can help us work faster, 
smarter, and allow us to tell stories in new ways. However, I caution us that if we don't approach these news tools with a respect for the core values of news, we will undermine journalism. While a headline or a flashy presentation might divert the eye, it's the values embedded in your content that will build long-term audiences, and in that, the viability of your business. So we are in a golden age, uh, but only if we collectively realize that everybody in that room uh, are the founding, and founding fathers and mothers of this new age. As founders, what you think and do today will be the basis for how journalism continues to grow and evolve. The advantage of technology is only one half of the equation. What we do with these tools to ensure that our news is an essential part of building and improving our communities is the more important part of the equation. So the next two days are a wonderful time to dive into the depths of the new digital workflow, the role of data, crowdsourcing, and social media. I hope you spend this valuable time learning, connecting with each other, and talking about how to build the future of journalism. It's a wonderful time to be a part of journalism. I'm very sorry that I'm not, I'm not there, uh, but I hope you have a wonderful next two days. Thank you very much.